All right, welcome today. Uh, today today's Lunch and Learn series, uh, everybody. I'm glad to have you here with us. Today, we're going to be talking about managing the business side of your business. Um, it's part of our November series on mastering your operations. Um, so hopefully you find this one a good complement to the other topics we've covered this month. Uh, before we jump in, uh, Kathleen, anything in the poll results that we should be aware of? Yes. Specifically, the questions... Well, 75% of the attendees say that their business is full-time and 25% are part-time with a full-time job. Back office functions they need help with the most. The largest group said marketing and sales planning at 38%. Then business planning and financial management tied at 25% and legal and compliance was 13%. Then when we talk about the biggest hurdle in completing the functions, it's tied with having the right tools or knowing where to start, what to prioritize. And then secondarily was knowing what tasks should be on the list. Okay, great. All right, that's good. Thanks everybody for responding. All right, so let us jump right in. So before we jump into the content, I want to start with a little thought exercise to have you think about how you want to, what you want to get out of this, um, the session today. I want you to ask yourself, why did you start your business? And there could be a whole host of reasons why. Maybe you love to sell. Maybe you wanted to be your own boss. Maybe you had this product that you think is a million dollar idea. Maybe you're in the service industry and you want to share your expertise with the world. Maybe you love the leadership aspect and you want to be pa you're passionate about helping people. Maybe you want to empower and lead a team to success. Or maybe it's just simple that this is your dream and this is what you've always wanted to do. There could be a lot of different reasons why you started a business. And there are a lot of exciting parts about running your own business. Here are some of them on the slide here. So whether it's creating a new product, whether it's designing the service that you want to deliver, maybe meeting with customers, making that sale, celebrating that sale when you get home and you realize that the client has decided to go with you. Such a great feeling. Servicing your clients, helping to work through and solve their problems for them. Helping to protect, perfect your product and service through innovation. Helping to figure out the new ways you can help your clients solve their problems. Maybe researching the competition to get an edge. So much fun to figure out how you can differentiate yourself. Or maybe expanding into new products and services. So what do all these things have in common? We're not going to really be discussing them today, being a little glib. Parts of these may you know, filter into what we're going to talk about today, but what we're going to largely cover today are what we call the business side of your business. These are sometimes called the back office functions. They're largely administrative. They're not necessarily the fun things, probably not the reasons you got into running your own business. However, if you do these well and you put the right processes in place, they can help Capital help you capitalize on the opportunities that are in the market and really help your business grow and thrive. So that's the goal today is to really identify these tasks and categories and help you come up with some tools and ideas to help plan for them. So the general categories we're going to talk about here are listed on the page. We're going to start with some finance tasks, talk a little bit about legal and compliance. Saw that wasn't a big focus area in the poll. We're going to talk about business planning and strategy. How do you fit these big tasks into your thought process and when to do them. Uh, talk a little bit about marketing and sales plans, also managing your inventory, which is really applicable for all businesses, not just retail and manufacturing. And we're also going to talk a little bit about how you get all this done. And I've got a tool that hopefully you can, you can um, find helpful. I think one of the most important keys to success on this is not just the what, but the when. And what I mean by that, that phrase is, you know you have a list of things to do, but also how are you going to do them and when are you going to do them? Now, we are coming up on the end of the year. It is generally the time when businesses start planning and thinking about the next year. And in fact, Kathleen and I are actually going to be teaching a series starting in late January about getting your new year off on the right foot. Um, a whole host of advice, uh, pieces of advice on different topics. So look for that one. But just as an aside, this is that time of year where you start to think about how do I get organized? How do I think about getting all these things done and setting myself up for success for new year? So I think this, the topics we're going to talk about today can be helpful along those lines. So we're going to start with financial management. A lot of you probably have seen me teach webinars before know that I have a finance background. Um, so this is kind of near and dear to my heart. 
Um, the first category is really around maintaining your financial records. So thinking about these back office functions and having the processes in place and the good practices. So what's on that list of things? Well, it's reviewing your financial activity, whether it's your credit cards or your bank statements. It's updating your books weekly, hopefully in a financial software like QuickBooks. It's reconciling your bank accounts, making sure that you're staying on top of all the activity that's going through there. And it's reviewing your financial results monthly, looking at your QuickBook reports, looking at your balance sheet, your income statement, and your cash flow, and understanding how did I do this month? Maybe it's against the budget. Maybe it's just against your own kind of internal expectations. Another aspect of financial management is client management. So what does this mean? Well, if you're invoicing your clients to make sure that they're paying on time, maybe you need to do that when the work is complete or otherwise agreed upon. A lot of business owners will have a formal process for doing that. Maybe it's through QuickBooks or another software. Um, keeping current with your invoicing weekly. That is an advice where at least you want to do that once a week. Maybe you do it immediately. Um, we had somebody do some work at our house the other day, and he immediately emailed us an invoice through his QuickBooks application. And now it's top of mind on my mind as the customer, I've got to pay that. And it went, paid it right online, right into his QuickBooks. He got instant cash payment. A, ni a nice business practice, a good business practice. Another aspect of client management that I think is helpful for folks to do is keeping an updated customer pipeline list. One of my clients has a really good model for this. She just uses Excel. It was, it, it's what works for her. You can also use different um, CRM tools, but, and she's got it organized into how she looks at her business. So it's, you know, first on the list are clients that the work has been complete, completed, invoiced, and paid. Then she's got, you know, the category of clients that have been invoiced, but not yet paid. Then it's the clients that are sold, but she hasn't done the work yet. Then she's got different prospects and the prospects might be organized by pipeline stage to say, okay, um, these ones I've got a bid out, but they haven't responded yet. These ones we've had a couple of conversations, but there's been no formal agreement yet. And then these ones are just exploratory options that I'm still calling. And that's a way for her to basically take a fresh look at her pipeline once a week and say, do I need to make any updates if any clients have moved up or down the pipeline? And also what are my tasks that I need, need to do to help move those clients up the category, move them from bid to sold, you know, sold to completed, et cetera. So client management, thinking about that as a, an aspect of financial management um, is another way to look at it. Along those same lines is what I call vendor management. So here's where you must deal with a wide variety of vendors, regardless of what kind of industry you're in. If you're in the food service industry, you might be dealing with buying ingredients or supplies from various vendors. And you might also have your utility vendors or your accountant or your attorney or your insurance agent. Um, having a good inventory of all your vendors, this kind of goes to good uh, record keeping practices, keeping an inventory. And it could just be a simple list. And maybe you need to organize them between recurring vendors that you work with all the time, or maybe the one-time vendors that you dealt with where they filled a special order for you and you keep them on your list and you know, all right, I'm going to go back to them if I need anything. Um, you know, it might be a good idea to organize them by what I would call cost category or just how you think about them. Uh, maybe they're a supplier of materials for you. Maybe they're just a, a fixed uh, overhead back office function, like an insurance agent or an attorney. Uh, maybe you need to know upcoming payments to them. Um, as you get new invoices or new information emerges, maybe keeping an, an updated list for that. Um, so that might be a good idea if you've got a big list of um, vendors that you're dealing with. If not, maybe you don't only need to manage this once a month or once every couple of months. The last one I've got on here on financial management is cash management. And this one really depends on the business that you're in and kind of where you are in the life cycle of your business. So I saw a number of you were startups um, when we did the poll at the beginning. So this could be really applicable to you, especially if you've got a business that is capital intensive up front and you are really tight on your financing. You might need to manage your cash really tightly, maybe by week, looking at your, you know, what's going through your bank account week to week. What do you have for upcoming payments that you need to make week to week over the next month or two or three? Um, you know, what do you have for upcoming client payments that you need to make sure are going to pay on time? Um, there's different tools you can do for this. Um, another one of my clients um, has a really great practice that she works on with her accountant. She's been in business for a number of years, but she has like a, a rolling 13-week 
um, cash outlook, which basically says for the next 13 weeks, give me my starting cash balance. What are my expected client uh, payments that are going to be coming in? And what are the big vendor payments I need to make? So that she can have every week, she can look, you know, once that's been updated, she can look at that cash outlook and say, it's almost like a thermometer and say, is it running hot, medium, or cold? Uh, is the wind blowing with her or in her face in terms of how she's going to feel about cash? Because that can help her determine, do I need to make any course correcting actions on, well, I've got a big vendor payment coming up in five weeks. I better make sure that client payment that's due in four weeks is going to get paid with certainty. So that's another way to look at it. Um, again, this task is a little bit, um, you know, the timing on this one can just be a, a bit, a bit more uh, flexible depending upon where you are in your business state. So along with the concept of financial management is tax planning. Now I'm not a licensed CPA, but I've got enough finance experience and, and done enough webinars around the, the basic area of taxes that I'll give you some general guidelines. The best advice I can give you is to work with a CPA in this, but a lot of times people, as we think about these back office functions, think when it comes to tax planning, income taxes is top of mind. So we're going to talk about that first. Now, a lot of times folks think I got to do my taxes once a year, and that's the only time they think about it. But income tax planning is not just a once a year strategy. It really needs to be thought of over the course of the year. That could depend on the status of your business. If this is your full-time business and it's your primary source of income, this is definitely going to be an area of focus for you over the course of the year. If it's a side hustle that you've just started out and you still have a full-time job, tax planning is probably not going to be the most important thing you need to worry about yet. Um, and that's just because the impact of your income from your side hustle on your overall income, if you've got a full-time job, that income of your side hustle is not going to be that big, that it's going to move the needle on your overall tax situation. But your tax planning can be influenced by so many factors, your income levels, your filing status. Do you have other sources of income, um, investment properties? You own a real estate property that you rent. Um, you know What your deduction situation is? Do you have dependents? There's a wide variety of things that can go into your tax liability every year. The state of Connecticut and the IRS are going to require you to make estimated tax payments for your income taxes. And that's required every quarter. You have to stay on top of that because if you pay zero taxes in throughout the course of the year and wait to pay everything when you file your tax return the following March or April, you're probably going to have some fines and interest to pay. So that's just something to be cognizant of. So as you think about these back office functions, thinking I got to focus on my taxes at least a few times a year. My advice, think through your quarterly estimated income tax payments. You've got your annual tax filings. Work with your accountant to plan accordingly. You're going to definitely want to meet with them at least once a year to talk through your taxes, probably twice a year. You know, I put an example here, maybe semi-annually, maybe every six months um, to think through tax planning. Um, but that's just something to keep on your list. And then to, to piggyback back on the last slide about your financial management, keeping your financial records organized and staying on top of your books and records is going to help you immensely when it comes to tax planning, because you can help work with your accountant to answer a lot of their questions up front and not be scrambling trying to gather a bunch of information. So there's other taxes to worry about. The first are self-employment, or the next ones are the self-employment and payroll taxes. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail on these ones because these are really business specific, um, depending upon your sources of income, depending upon if you have employees. My advice on this one is talk to your accountant about this when you meet with them to understand what your liabilities are. If you have employees and you're using a payroll service provider, work with them on that, but add these tasks to your list of these back office functions that you need to think about and what you know frequency you're going to need to to deal with them. Um, the other, the last one is sales taxes. So this is one where, um, again, depending upon the industry that you're in, you may or may not be subject to sales taxes with the state of Connecticut. Um, recommend that you consult with the Connecticut Department of Revenue Services website. Um, you can look at the industries and professions that are subject to sales taxes. Understand what your requirements are if you are required to collect and remit sales taxes to the state and complete a filing. Um, understand how often you need to do that and put that in your task list, put that in your planning list. Um, you know, I, I've told the story probably before, but I had a client that I was meeting with one day and I said, How are things going? And she was, you know, a little bit frustrated that she just got a late notice from the Connecticut uh, Department of Revenue Services that she didn't file her sales tax report for, for that month or that quarter. And it was a small fine, but she was a little annoyed by it. 
And then she looked and realized that she did in fact miss the deadline. So she said, I'm going to go put a note in my calendar such that every month I know I've got to file it on this day every month. So the next area is legal and compliance. I won't spend too much time on this one because I, I know this wasn't a big area of, of focus in the poll. Um, but some of you may be subject to different contracts. You may enter into contracts with customers um, or vendors if you've got a landlord or you're hiring somebody to do a significant project. Um, my advice on this one is to the extent there's you have any questions or you're concerned about any risks you face um, and protect yourself and your risks, consult with a business attorney on this one. Um, you know, a lot of times with a customer contract, if you're entering into the service business, um, you can develop a standard contract up front that covers a lot of the provisions that you want to work with in terms of the work you're going to provide, payment terms, liability, you know, protection, that kind of thing. Work with an attorney on this one to set up a standard contract. And then as business dynamics evolve with the services that you're offering, um, you know, you can you can modify that as you go through things. Um, talked a little bit about insurance, <clears throat> recommend that you have business insurance, um, regardless of the industry that you're in, this just helps protect you and your business assets. Um, you're going to want to put this on your list of things to look at probably annually, um, meet with an agent, talk about any recent business changes. That's going to th be thing that helps determine any coverage changes you need. If you've expanded into a dramatically different service that helps, um, or that exposes you from a new liability standpoint, or you're opening up a new location and you need um, you know, additional insurance coverage for that. Some of these things may come up top of mind as they happen, but as you talked with you, putting this on your list of things to do once a year uh, can help you kind of vet these things with, with an insurance expert. Permits and licenses, uh, this varies by business type. So um, recommend that you consult with the state of Connecticut small business website on this. Um, you know, some of them are obvious, like if you're a contractor, you need to be licensed electrician, that kind of thing. Some of them you may or may not be aware of if you need to be licensed to do anything. If you're creating food product or health and beauty products out of your home, you may or may not be required to get a license. Um, so consult with that one. Um, you know, more than likely, these are going to require an annual renewal process. So put that on your list of, you know, kind of compliance things to make sure you're staying on top of. Um, and then the other one I have in here is, depending upon where you live and what you do business in, you may need to require a license um, or a permit in your town. Um, so just consult with one on, on that one. Business planning and strategy. So a lot of people know that they should do a business plan or they need to do a business plan. When do you do it? How do you do it? Well, we've taught different webinars on doing business planning. There's a lot of advice on, on this. Um, I would say business planning is probably one of the more common topics that we help our clients with as SCORE mentors. Um, so if you need some assistance on that or some templates, we can definitely help you with that. But I want to talk about the actual kind of doing the activity and thinking about how do you fit this into the aspect of running your business. So you'll often hear us talk about how business plans and strategy documents are living documents. And Jag mentioned this in his project planning session last week, about how he thinks about project planning as living documents. So what does that mean? Well, that just means that you can modify it week to week, month to month as things change. You're not going to do a business plan, put it in stone and never change it. You may have to modify it as things change, but that doesn't mean you need to worry about your business plan every single day because you have a business to run. So what should you do? Well, I like to think about business planning as an annual exercise. This is actually the perfect time of year to be doing a business plan. A lot of big companies are doing their plans right now. They're trying to set their goals before the end of this year so that when they hit the ground, they're running after the holidays in early January, they know what their goals are. They know what those objectives are. So you may not have started a business plan. That's fine. You don't have to complete it by December 31st. But I would say by the early part of 2024, you want to have a business plan in place. And then you know kind of these are what my goals are for the year. Um now that business planning exercise, it could be a brand new exercise if you were just starting out or you've never done anything. It doesn't have to be super comprehensive. It could be a few pages. Um, we've taught different classes on this. And again, a score mentor can help you with that. Um, you could also do a refresh of a previous plan. So if you had your business plan from last year and you think it's a little bit old, it's a little stale, let me refresh it for 2024, make sure I'm, I'm comfortable with everything. And there's some specific goals you wanna make for the new year. Um, there's different components of a business plan. I've listed some of them here. Um, this is probably not all inclusive, but you want to think about the capabilities of the products and services that you're bringing 
um, to your goals for the year, what your sales goals are, the marketing plan you're going to in enact to achieve those Sam, those sales goals, how to think about the competitive assessment. Um, and you know, what's the competition doing? How have they changed recently? How are you going to differentiate against them? Um, and then the, what your financial goals are. Um, you know, I like to encourage people to think about the business goals, driving the financial goals. If you set financial goals and say, I want to sell X amount of, of uh, revenue and make profit of Y, and then I'm going to figure out the plan on how to do that later, it's going to be really difficult to get there. You really want to think about the, the business goals, how are you going to achieve those business goals and the financial goal, the financial results being an outcome of that. And if you do that and you decide that the financial goals are not good enough and you want them to be better, maybe you can go back and revisit the sales and marketing goals or the product goals that you've got. Um, so you do your business plan once a year, you know, that's a significant back office function. It's not going to be something you're looking at every day as you're servicing clients, but you do want to take a look at your plan and how you're doing against that plan against your goals. You don't want to wait till the end of the next year and say, how did I do? I'd recommend looking every few months, maybe every month if you need to, um, you know, if things are running really tight and you think like, gosh, I wish, I think I should be selling more. I think I should be making more money. Maybe go back and look at your, your plan more frequently, but Again, not something you want to be focused on week to week because you can't spend all your time planning and refining your plan because you have a business to run. Strategy development. So this is this can be a tricky one depending upon the state of your business. So um, if you're just starting out, your business strategy is going to probably be incorporated into your business plan as kind of the leading aspect. Like, what is my strategy? What am I trying to achieve? What do I look at at the market? And kind of what are my goals for the next year? Um you know, I always think about strategy evolving into a business plan. Um, larger businesses that have been around a long time will do a longer term outlook for their strategy and thinking about the next three to five years because they've got a history of experience. Um, your strategy may also be, I've been in business for 10, 15 years. I've been doing this for a long time. I've got to go to handle on the market. I know how to do my annual business plan, but um I want to think about how to sell my business and I want to think about getting out and retiring. And that could be a strategic exercise. So depending upon where you are in the life cycle of your business, um, the strategy development could be two different things. Regardless of that, when you do an annual business plan, you want to have some strategic component in there because at the end of the day, your business plan has got to be anchored to an overall strategy on how you're going to win. Marketing and sales. So this is probably the one that is clo most closely connected to what I would call the actual aspect of running your business, right? These are there's some back office functions to these, but they're these were also part of, you know, integral to how you're running your business week to week. But if you think about the planning aspect of marketing and sales and thinking about the marketing and sales plans being an integral part of your business plan, that is more of a function that you're going to do maybe at least once a year, maybe a few times a year. So when would you kind of revisit things? Well, it could be if things are humming along and you feel good about things and you think, wow, my, my marketing is working. I'm getting good customers. I feel like, you know, things are humming right along. I'm good. I don't need to revisit everything. But if you start to see aspects of your business going positive or negative, um, a lot of times folks will think like, well, I got to change my marketing plan because I'm not selling enough. But it could also be that you set out with a handful of services and you thought you were going to focus on service A being the one that would resonate the most with your clients, but maybe service C is selling like gangbusters. And you think maybe I need to market this more because it's resonating with clients and I make a really good profit margin on it. It's a positive aspect of my business results, but I'm going to tweak my marketing plan because it's doing so well. So both positive or negative business um, outcomes can help drive the need for change on this one. So these are just some components that I thought of for a marketing or sales plan. I'm sure I don't have all of them here, but thinking about your product and service capability assessment, that competitive analysis, a pricing model is important. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're, you're I don't want to go too deep on this, but when you're, you're setting your pricing strategy, thinking about what does it cost you to service your product? How much profit do you want to make? What's the market like for a similar product? Will the customer pay for it? That's kind of integral to your marketing. Um, distribution strategy. How are you going to sell your product? How are you going to reach your customers? Uh, securing resources. This could be both finance, um, how you're going to uh, secure the money you need 
to run your marketing and sales plan and potentially people and resources if you got to rely on others to help you out, whether they work for you or you're just going to hire them part-time. When do you kind of update or refresh your marketing and sales plan? I like to think about it ahead of your busiest season, if that's applicable. Um, thinking about when you're going to go to market, um, if you've got a, a cyclical nature of your business. Um, I always use the landscaping business as an example, because that's got a very seasonal aspect to it. Um, you know, thinking about when you're going to go to market and then having your marketing and sales plan in place well in advance of that. Um, one of my favorite phrases that I used to use when I when I worked was right to left planning, which is thinking about what's that future event that is going to happen. I know that's going to happen in October. How do I plan from now till then and go backwards in time to think about all the things I need to do to make sure that I'm ready to hit the ground running when that busy season starts on October 1st? So right to left planning could be a helpful aspect on, on thinking through this. Managing inventory. So I put this in with marketing and sales because it's you know somewhat related. Uh, a lot of times people will think, well, I don't have inventory. I'm a service business. Um, if you do have a retail or manufacturing business, inventory is a huge part of this. So thinking through maybe your busy season or your marketing and sales plan, ensuring that you've got everything in stock uh, that you're going to need to ship. Um, if you're, if that's how you're selling things, or maybe you're, uh, you've got things in, um, in a physical location, uh, maybe you're in the food service business and you've got a restaurant, so you got to make sure you've got the goods that you need to sell, uh, everything on hand. But if you're in the services business, your content can be your inventory. If you're a consultant delivering, um, you know, expert information on how people, how, you know, customers can, can solve certain problems, um, in a certain, you know, niche market that you help. Or maybe you've got a software product that you're delivering. That is that is inventory. Ensuring that your content um, inventory is ready to go ahead of your marketing and sales season uh, is going to be important. So depending upon the industry that you're in, thinking through um, if this concept of inventory applies to you. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the time of, of year to do this I, or how frequently it, you know, I like to think about doing this in conjunction with your sales and marketing plans, as I was just saying. But if you're in the retail or manufacturing um, industry, you know, doing a physical inventory is really important. You're going to want to have some ongoing tracking of understanding what you have in stock for materials or what they call work in progress or finished goods. Um, and then a lot of businesses will do what's called a physical inventory where they count everything they've got on hand, compare it to their inventory records and do any reconciliations or true ups if they need to. If you're running a physical store, this is very important to manage. Um, a lot of businesses will do this at least annually, if not quarterly. Um, I had a retailer once uh, that I worked with who, you know, this was something that they had to manage very carefully because they had to ensure they understood the inventory they had on hand physically and then what was in their their financial records and their, uh, their QuickBooks. So how do you get all this done? Well, if you've attended any webinar with me, you know that I love Excel. So my first piece of advice would be keep calm and start a spreadsheet, one of my favorite expressions. But if you're not, you know, using spreadsheets all the time. There's some other resources out there. Um, you can use some product management tools. Um, you know, the kind of the, the advice that JAG was giving uh, last week on managing projects, you know, doing these back office tasks, these are like projects. You know, these are things that you're going to be doing that you, they're not necessarily a marketing project or a new um, product that you've got to develop, but doing some of these tax, uh, tasks are in essence projects. Um, just some other tools that you can use, obviously having a financial software for a lot of the financial management ones I talked about, I mentioned some CRM tools that are out there for managing your customer and vendor information, a lot of online business resources. And then think about consulting with your business team. Uh, that could be your CPA, your attorney, insurance agent, and then of course, a score mentor. Um, if you are, you know, comfortable using spreadsheets for things, um, you know, I did, I did create a, a quick little template that I'm going to share now. Um, just to try, and I'll share this with folks along with the presentation. Um, you'll get this in the email with the recording link tomorrow. So this is something that I just, I came up with just to say, if you wanted to do something like this, what might it look like? So the way this is organized is I've got the, the tasks listed here. I've got them organized by category. I picked the categories that I used to describe this today. Um, and then I've got specific tasks. I put in here the frequency, like how often are you going to do this? And then also if there's any dependency that you would need. Um, and you could modify this however you want um, and whatever works for you. And you could you know, set this up on whatever 
kind of helps with how you like to organize things. Um, and then you can see I, what I put over here was just the months of the year. And um, if you attended the Excel class that um, we did a couple months ago, I applied a couple of the, the you know, kind of the viewing tools that we did. So I created some filters and, and froze the panes here to make it easier to read. So we just did kind of some examples here. So I, I put some financial management ones in here, you know, update my QuickBooks. I'm going to do that weekly. Do I have a dependency? Yes, I need to have my bank activity. And I'm going to put that every month because I'm going to do it every week. Um, I'm going to invoice my clients. Um, and, you know, uh, that's part of financial management. Uh, what's the dependency? Well, I've got to have the work completed. Um, maybe one of my tasks is to follow up on open receivables from clients. Again, I'm going to do that every other week because a lot of my clients, I don't need to worry about that every other week or every week, but maybe just every other week is fine. Um, and I'll, you know, I got to have the work completed for that. Uh, I'm going to update my customer pipeline report. So I talked about that being a task and I'd only need to do that monthly um, because the activity doesn't change enough week to week. Uh, we talked about tax planning. Um, so this one I'm going to do twice a year. So I've got to make sure my financial records are updated. So when am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to put an X in for March and I'm going to put one in for September because those would be good times a year to, to do that. I'm going to do my estimated tax payments. I do that four times a year. Well, I know the deadlines are January, April, June, or October, and June. So I know those are the four dates. So I got to put those in for that month because they've got to be done by that. Um, let's say my sales tax filings are due monthly. So I'm going to put that in for every month. Uh, my business insurance renewal, that one gets renewed once a year and it gets done in September of every year. So I'm going to put that in there. Um, I know I've got to renew my business license once a year, and that always comes due May 31st. So I'm going to put that in for May. Um, here's one that, you know, in the planning and strategy one where I kind of wanted to talk through a little bit. So here I've got, well, I'm going to refresh my strategic goals. I'm going to refresh my business plan. I'm going to think through my marketing plan and refresh my content. Um, so I want to do all that as part of my kind of planning and strategy and marketing and sales. And I think about, all right, when am I going to do this? Well, my business plan, I want to do at the end of the year for the following year. So I'm going to do that in October, November, and December. I think, okay, that's that's pretty good. And then I'm going to do my strategic goals. Well, based on kind of what my busy season is, I'm not going to be able to do that till October or November. And I'm going to do my marketing plan and refresh content. I'm going to do that, you know, kind of in September, October. You know, one of the things that you could do when you do this kind of exercise is you could filter on a certain month. And you could say, let me go see how much I have going on in October. And I think, wow, I've got a ton of stuff going on in October. Not only my stuff that I get to do every week or every month, but I got to do all this big ticket stuff. Am I really going to be able to do all of these things in the month of October? Maybe I need to think about moving things some, you know, back a little bit. Um, so this is a way using some of these filters and, um, you know, you could also say like, you know, when am I going to do uh, my, my planning and strategy work? Um, you could filter on the planning and strategy category and say, okay, you know, maybe I need to think about doing um, my my strategic goals. Maybe I'm going to, instead of doing these in October, November, maybe I'm going to do these in like May or June, just because it's not that busy. I can carve out time. I can be strategic and think about the long term of my business. And then when I get down to October, November, December, I can, um, I can you know, do things then. And then the other thing I, I mentioned was, you know, you do your plan once a year, but you want to take a fresh look at it quarterly and see how you're doing. So I'm going to think, all right, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to do my quarterly assessment. That's what we're going to call a quarterly assessment. We're going to put it in the planning and strategy or strategy category. Um, we're going to call this quarterly performance assessment. We're going to do it quarterly. I think, all right, when am I going to do this? Dependent? Well, I've got to have my financial records updated because um, I'm going to probably use that as a lens to look through. Um, so when am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to do once a quarter. So what if I do this in like March, June, September, and maybe December? Let's say, you know, that that's going to be the, the time of year I'm going to do that. Um, and you could tweak that a little bit. It doesn't have to be, you know, on the quarter end. So that's, this is just a tool that you could use. Again, if you're familiar with Excel, um, you can use something like this to kind of set your, get your tasks all put on one, one spreadsheet and put them in these categories. You could filter and sort them as best you can. Then look at the year and think about how things are going to go. And then 
what you could do with this is this is a tool that you could update once or twice a year. But then when you go to think about your planning of your, whether you call it a project plan or a time management plan of how you're going to manage your deliverables over the next month or two, you could use this as a list to say, well, I've got to, I know I've got to update QuickBooks. I know I've got to invoice my clients. Those are the things that I've got to do weekly. When during the next week, am I going to carve out that time? Um, so a lot of you didn't mention that having enough time to do these things um, was a was an issue, but I know clients that I've worked with at times where I'll talk to them, I generally mentor a lot of clients on the finance side. So I'll be like, all right, hey, let's go through your financial results. And sometimes they'll be like, well, I haven't updated my QuickBooks for like three months, so I don't really know what's going on. Or I, you know, I'm, I'm behind on invoicing, or I haven't really looked at my bank reconciliations, that kind of thing. So being able to carve out time for these back office functions is really important, um, but it's also really hard to do. So I'm, I'm going to share a, a few best tips here. Um, just I'll pull up the the PowerPoint again, um, and and some of this kind of goes hand in hand with with what Kathleen was talking about about thinking through how to prioritize because she mentioned prioritizing sometimes the work you don't want to do because let's be honest, updating QuickBooks is probably not the most exciting thing you're doing as part of running your business. Um, as an example. So I want you to think through some of the lessons that we we learned in the first three modules, right? You, thinking about these, doing these tasks and staying on top of these important functions as being goals that you need to achieve as part of running your business. It's not 80% of your business, maybe it's only 10, but that 10% can really help drive the other 90% of your business and being successful. Um, using, you know, that aspect of turning goals into actions and thinking about, I know I want to have a better handle on my financials. What are the actions I need to take to achieve that goal? Project planning. What I just outlined is very similar to what Jag talked about in terms of thinking through project planning and thinking about these tasks, um, as projects you need to achieve and then conquering the important work. Um, this is probably the hardest part of things because, I oftentimes, and Kathleen talked about this as well, where you really need to be in the right headspace to do certain of these things. Um, you may find that your brain does not work trying to go through your numbers at nine o'clock in the morning. You're much better off after you have your second cup of coffee at 1130 in the morning. And maybe that's where your brain works best when you're working through your numbers. Um, best advice I can give you is to carve out time once a week on your calendar for weekly tasks, or maybe once a month for the larger monthly tasks. Um, I had a client that I worked with who, um, he ran his own business. He'd been running it for like 20 years. And whenever we would meet, we would always meet on Thursday because he was out quoting jobs every day of the week. But Thursday was the day that he spent in his office. He typed up quotes. He did invoicing. He looked at his QuickBooks and that's when he wanted to meet with his score mentor. He carved out Thursday is his kind of managing the business side of the business day. And that's what he did. And that worked for him. Um, so the extent you can do that, um, it would be helpful. It helps get you in the right headspace um, to focus only on those things because if you try to switch from different topic to topic that are dramatically different aspects of using your brain, it's going to be harder. It's going to take you longer to get in that mindset of, oh, no, okay, I've, I know I've got to look at these financial things. I know I've got to think about you know, my business plan. Um and then also, can you plan general windows of time throughout the year to do the annual tasks? You're not going to be able to get everything done in one week. Um, so thinking through, looking at the landscape of the 12 months of the year and knowing when am I most busy? When am I least busy? When am I going on vacation? Um, you know, what are the critical dependencies? If I want to do my business planning in the October, November timeframe, can I carve out time in September to really make sure that my product and service is refined and I've got my marketing and sales plan nailed so that I can dovetail that right into my business plan in the fall. And then when I get to January, I'm, I'm off and ready to go. Um, this next as as aspect is really important and that's managing distractions. Um, so again, Kathleen talked about this a little bit the other day, responding to emails or text messages. We all do it. Um, we all carve out our brain. We're in the middle of something. You get a notification. You think, oh my God, I got to respond to this right now. Um, Manage your notifications as best you can, turning the sound off, turning those email notifications off. Um, if you can carve out time to respond to customers and vendors, I know customers is really hard to say, I'm going to wait till the very end of the day. But, you know, if you can carve out time twice a day and say from, you know, one to two, I'm going to focus on responding to emails. And then at two o'clock, I know I've got to go do this. And then I'll respond to emails again at 530 at the end of the day. 
Um, that way you're constantly keeping your brain focused on what you're working on during that window of time. And then I mentioned this a little bit about knowing when you're in the right mindset. I have this quote in here that I, that I joke, like sometimes you can't just wake up one day and say, okay, let's be strategic. Um, because you got to be in the right headspace. Um, if you're thinking about the strategy of your business and what's going to resonate with clients and you may say, all right, on Friday, I'm going to be strategic. You may, 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 may wake up on Friday and may be really nice out. You don't have a lot of customers demanding your time. And you may think, I want to get out of here. I want to forget about work for a few hours. And I'm not going to be, I'm not going to hunker down and work on my strategic plan today. But as Kathleen mentioned, you may go off and distract yourself from the work side of your, of your brain and go do something really fun. And a lot of the strategic ideas may start coming to you naturally. So knowing when you're in, in the right mindset to do these things um, can't always be perfect because sometimes you got to hunker down and get it done because there's a deadline and you know you have to do it. Um, but hopefully some of these, these tips um, are helpful. So that's it for the prepared content. Oh, we're do, doing pretty good on time. So I'm um, interested in any questions that you have. Um, and we have plenty of time for questions. So if you have any, please chime in. Um, we also have a mentor poll that we're going to put up. If you are interested um, in learning how to get a SCORE mentor or signing up for a SCORE mentor, um, please respond to the poll now. Um, we promise we will not barrage you with emails. You will get one email from me later today with instructions on how to do this. Um, but it's just a way for us to help you find a mentor. So Kathleen will launch that poll now. And we will take a look at that. We'll keep that up for a few minutes if you are interested. Um, and with that, I think we'll open it up for Q&A. Kathleen, anything in the Q&A box that we should uh, start with? We have one to start with. And we want to remind everybody that you can feel free to type your questions now if you haven't already. Uh, I'm. We may need further clarification on this question. This is from Susan who says, I have paid income taxes to state and fed quarterly in the past. Is that because I didn't make enough or is that new? So um, it's not new. Um, so the way to think about the income taxes, um, I, I like to use analogies when I explain things. So I'm gonna use an analogy for this one. Um, when you're working full-time for an employer and they're taking out uh, your withholdings, they're they're withdrawing money from your paycheck for federal and state income taxes every two weeks in your paycheck or every week. And they send that money to the IRS and they send that money to the state of Connecticut. And then when you do your taxes at the end of the year, you're basically, you're, you're completing your tax return and you calculate how much income tax you owe and it's compared to how much was withheld. So at that point, the, the state and the IRS basically say, if you owe $1,000 and you already sent us 800 by way of your employer, send us another $200, that's what you owe on your tax return. When you own your own business and you're the only one making money and you don't have an employer, nobody is performing that withholding task for you. You have to do that yourself. And the way you do that is that $800 that you would normally have withheld from your paycheck, you do that through a process called making quarterly estimated income tax payments. You can do that right on the IRS website. You can do that right on the state of Connecticut website. You put in your name, your social security number, your EIN, whatever information you need um, to identify yourself. And you put in there that you're making an estimated tax payment. Now, the trick is figuring out how much to pay. So that's, you're a little bit trying to, to predict how much am I going to owe in taxes when I file my tax return the following March or April. Your accountant can help you with that. Um, they can kind of say, how did, how do you think about how much money you're going to make this year? And you can, you can do one of these. Um, to help figure that out. It doesn't have to be perfect um, because you know at the end of the day, you're either going to be overpaid or underpaid and you're going to have to either pay a little bit more or get a refund. The reason you want to do quarterly estimated tax payments is, in my example, if you owe $1,000 in taxes and you go to file your tax return and you're withholding or your estimated payments was zero, the state of Connecticut is going to say, it's March of 2024. You should have been making some sort of payment throughout all of 2023 and so you're going to have to pay a little bit of a fine and you're going to probably have to pay interest on underpayments. So you want to try to avoid that. So I know that was very long-winded, but hopefully that answers your question. He responded saying, that's what I did. I thought you mentioned monthly. And I think oh. what you mentioned monthly was sales taxes. Yes. So um, sales taxes, I'm not as familiar with, but I do believe um, you're required to file monthly with the state of Connecticut. 
Um, just double check that on the Department of Revenue Services website. Um, if you are required to um, to comply with the sales tax rules, um, you have to collect the sales tax from your customers. You have to remit or send that money to the state of Connecticut along with your filing. Um, you may even need to file something of a return, even if you don't have revenue for a certain month. So I uh, just research that and make sure you're in compliance with that one so you don't get any uh, nasty letters from the state. That answers her question. She thanks you very much. You're welcome. We have a question from Jody saying, can I request you as a mentor? And that's addressed to you, Steve. If uh, if I have the expertise that you need, thank you for the request. If I have the expertise that you need, uh, absolutely. Um, when, um, when I send the email out about mentoring, uh, one of the pieces of advice we give folks is when you fill out the form, it's a very quick form to fill out on our website. You just basically have to put in your contact info, name, phone number, email. Um, and then there's a there's a question box that says, what do you need help with? Um, so be as specific as you can in there. Um, if you put that you need help with marketing, I can't help you because I'm not a marketing person. But if you need help budgeting or cash flow, I might be a good fit because I have a finance background. Um, so we ask people to be as specific as possible because that way we can match you up with the mentor who has the right expertise. And if you start with somebody that is helping you with finance and you say, hey, this has been great, but I also need help with marketing, that mentor can go bring somebody in to help you with marketing and join the team. Um, so we provide kind of continual service through that way so that every time you start a new mentoring session, you don't have to start over and tell your story from the very beginning. All right, Jody has a follow-up that with a question of financial modeling. which I think is, do you help with financial modeling? Uh, yes, that budgeting is something that I do help with. All right. Mimi asks, how does a mentorship work for a fashion brand? And Mimi, if you could fill the, fill a, uh, ask the question further, like, do you mean score mentorship work with a, with a fashion brand? And if so, say yeah. And we'll just hold that one for now. Kate asks, sadly, I had a conflict when you did the Excel presentation. Is a recording available? And the answer is absolutely on our YouTube channel, which is if you go to YouTube and you look for Greater Hartford Score, we have a whole bunch of workshops on Excel. If you go to our Lunch and Learn playlist, you'll see several of them that Steve gave earlier this year on all kinds of more detailed topics related to Excel. If you want to know about finances and then the tools portion, he did one on how to use Excel. So depending on what it is you're looking for, whether it's you know how to use Excel, but you want to know how to do your finances, or if you don't even know how to use the tool at all or very little, he did one on how to use Excel. And they're all in that same playlist under Lunch and Learn. And Kate also says, I have benefited from mentoring previously. Oh, that's great. That's great. All right. So Mimi says, yes, she wants to know how uh, score mentoring would work for a fashion brand. And I can actually speak to that because I have been co-mentoring with somebody from New York who has a client who has a fashion brand. So... It's pretty similar to how mentoring works in general, which is depending on what you need help with. Obviously, if you need help with the production side, then we would, whoever your mentor is, would look for somebody who has experience with production itself. But if you're looking for how to market that brand, then marketing experts can help you with that, especially with social media, because I know Fashion is very social media heavy, particularly Instagram, to my knowledge. And so a lot of the time we spent with this person, we're talking about how she could utilize Instagram uh, to her best advantage. But oftentimes, general business knowledge, which was what all of our mentors have, can help you with the process of starting and running your business in general. And then we would search or you could do a search yourself online for people with fashion experience if you go to score.org. And Steve, chime in if you would like to. 
Yeah, I I wholeheartedly agree. I I I'm glad you could answer that one because because I could not. But you highlighted something that is really great about the score mentoring process is, you know, almost all the mentoring we're doing uh, these days is virtual. And what's what's nice about that is that it's it's super convenient for for the clients, um, who can just you know pop into a meeting in the middle of their day if they need to. But also, we can tap into resources from across the country. Um, you know, I've I've searched our our national database and found clients with expertise in certain industries and had them join a client meeting from like Florida or you know Maryland just and Kathleen's doing that with New York so it's so that's another nice thing about from an industry standpoint that that we can we can help out with Jack asked the question for a management slash IT consulting business established just two months ago would I need to file quarterly tax payments or none? if very little dollars were made so far, or would it be the first quarter in 2024? So um, I'll answer this question as I as I answer every tax question, which with two comments, which is A, th this is not official tax advice, and B, it depends. That being said, the way you wanna think about your tax liability is, the IRS looks at this from a calendar year standpoint. So, they are basically saying you're filing your taxes in, let's say, April of 2024 for income that you earned in calendar year 2023. So, um, you know, you would have been if if you were I know this isn't the case with Jack's example, but if you were in business for 12 months of 2023, you would be making quarterly estimated payments throughout the entire calendar year. So what could skew that from being, you know, dramatically different than that one is if you start your business very late in the year. Um, you know, your tax liability is not going to be that great because you probably didn't have a lot of income and you were only in business for a couple of months, let's say. Um, the other factor that could be is if you have a full-time job and this is a very small piece of your total income, um, again, it's probably not going to move the needle. Um, but that being said, every situation is specific with, you know, there are so many factors, as I mentioned earlier, that go into your, your tax um, liability. Um, best advice is if you're concerned about it, you can research things online. You can talk to talk to a tax accountant. Um, you know, but if if you've got a full time job and you started up something the last couple months of the year and you didn't earn a lot of um, a lot of money uh, the last couple months of the year and you have a full time job on top of that, it's probably not going to you know make a hill of beans difference in terms of your tax liability. But again, uh, best advice is to consult with a, a, a licensed CPA on that one. All right. Um, Jody says, I also came in late. Unfortunately, Miss Kathleen, I'm founding a mega branded creator economy media tech platform. Can you help with operations? Um, and I think that question's for you, Steve, is to ask if you can mentor. Yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, I think that might be, might be something to address through a mentoring request. I was thinking the same thing, but that's, yeah. I think that's there are some people in our chapter even who have, who have significant operations experience in terms right. of running their own business operationally like that. And they probably would be your best bet. So just what Steve said earlier was the more detail you can provide in your request without running out of room in the, in the request form, the better, because often people are really cryptic and it's hard for our intake coordinator to figure out who to assign it to. But if you said, I'm creating an online network of some kind and I want help with how to operate the business side of it, or whatever it is specifically you want, the the more they can match you to someone who fits your criteria better. Yeah, I agree. And Jack and Jody and Susan say thank you so much. Great. For answering their questions. And we, right now we have no more questions. All right. We're just about at one o'clock. I wonder if we should. Uh, I wonder if we should wrap it up there. Okay. Here's Carolyn. You need to file your taxes, even if you made zero dollars for the quarter. If you don't, you'll get fined for not filing. 
the fine will be based on a standard income amount. So that's Carolyn's advice. We don't know Carolyn's credentials. Um, As always, you... consult, consult with your CPA would be my, my advice on that one. All right. So with that, I think we'll wrap up for today. Um, but before we go, um, if you are interested in learning more about SCORE, you can do so at SCORE.org. Um, you will receive a link to the recording for this tomorrow. And you uh, that recording will be available on our YouTube channel. And if you're interested in learning more about the Lunch and Learn series that we have or see all of the videos that we've got, you can check them out on our YouTube channel. You search for Greater Hartford SCORE. And while you're there, you can subscribe to be notified of future videos. Uh, so you can check that out there. And with that, Kathleen, I think we will stop the recording and want to thank everybody for joining.